Coming up on Garden Talk. Go ahead and soak it in dechlorinated water that's been pH'd at 5.5 to 5.7. I try to aim right at 5.7. That's kind of the sweet spot for cocoa. So if I'm in a seedling stage looking for the 200 ppm, I might make the compost tea 300 ppm. For indoor grows, I don't suggest anything bigger than a seven gallon. You're gonna get some monstrous plants. I generally try to tell people one gallons, three gallons, and five gallons are like really the best size pots. You're gonna get disheartened and you're not gonna to wanna to grow and you're not gonna to wanna to cultivate because you're gonna feel like you wasted a whole bunch of money. So less, 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 less is more. Let them brew, let them really become accessible. I mean, it's a night and day difference when you feed compost teas. Within two days, your plants will look completely different. So that's my favorite thing about organics. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, AKA Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 71. In this episode, I interview Derek also known as Chronic. He has been gardening for 13 years and grows a variety of plants, such as tomatoes, lettuce, herbs, medicinal varieties, and more. He makes his own super soil, and that's what he's gonna talk about in today's episode. He also touches upon compost teas, pH, PPM, container size, and water sources. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Spider Farmer for being a sponsor. A new grow light they released here in 2022 is the SE1000W. This was designed specifically for those of you who run CO2 in your grow space and really want to maximize the light intensity. It has a 10 bar design for an even light spread, pulls 1000 watts from the wall, and comes in at 2.9 micromoles per joule efficacy. The recommended coverage area is 4 feet by 4 feet or 5 feet by 5 feet. Use discount code MrGrowIt5 to save on all Spider Farmer products, and I'll leave a link in the video description section below. AC Infinity is a sponsor of the podcast. Coupon code Mr. Grow it will get you a discount on their products. I've been using their Cloudline T6 and T4 inline fans for several years now, and I absolutely love the automation built into them. On the inline fans controller, you can have set points for high and low temperature, as well as high and low humidity. This greatly helps control my indoor garden environment, so the temperature and humidity stays in the ideal ranges. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below. And don't forget to use coupon code Mr. Grow it for a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Derek from Homegrown World. How are you doing today? Good, man. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm super excited about today's topic. We're going to talk all about super soils and how to create them. I think a lot of people listening in on this, and a lot of people who garden in general, wants to make things more efficient, wants to be more hands-off. The ability to mix up a soil and then use that one batch throughout the entire grow. So you're just basically watering in the entire grow. So I think that's a lot of people's goals. I think it's easier said than done. But today we're going to talk all about that and how you do that and so on and so forth. But first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm an educator for medicinal plant medicine, as well as various um, mycology um, forums that I help write guides for. And just in general, I educate for uh, various plant and cultivation purposes for the last two years. I've done it on YouTube, Instagram, and um, as well as my own podcast. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I've grown up growing my own plants uh, from lettuce, tomatoes to medicinal uh, mushrooms like shiitake or culinary mushrooms like pink oysters to just so many more plants that I'm a huge animal and herb lover. So uh, definitely got to get my own, you know, mints and peppermints out of my garden for use in, in the kitchen. So it's definitely been a passion of mine for many years. Sweet. And then what's your style of gardening? Are you indoors, outdoors? What medium are you in? Are you organic? Or do you grow synthetic inputs and so on and so forth? So I've touched uh, on a little bit of all of those. I mainly do organic cultivation with soils now, but I've done pretty much every type of cultivation, but I prefer organic. Okay, cool. Let's get into the first question here, which is what is a super soil? 
So super soil is essentially, uh, well, that phrase was coined by actually, um, for many people who don't know, uh, there was a grower named Subcool um, that crafted a very um, legendary, um, it's called a legacy mix actually now because it's, it's created a legacy for himself. Um, he unfortunately has passed away, but since then, the Dank Company has kept this recipe, which is basically a specific blended soil that has the proper aeration, nutrient mixture, um, acidity level, whatever you're seeking as, as an individual cultivator to be able to grow your plant from start to finish, whether it be tomato plants, lettuce, anything like that, um, without having to add nutrients, or if you have have to add anything bare minimum of maybe a topping of earthworm castings so it's meant to pretty much be completely uh, sufficient with microbiology um, you know generally they include uh, microbial life whether it's you know some some uh, different mycorrhizae bacterials and things like that so the good stuff that you want in your garden but um, it's a mixture that's just a uh, just a good nutrient blend for your plant start to finish yeah, I've heard about the Subcool's Super Soil Mix, and there's a few other popular ones out there. Have you used any of those mixes, or do you have kind of your own? So I actually do my own blend. I've used Coots before once or twice. Um, I think I've used it once back on a farm years ago in Florida. I can't guarantee that, but I have used it since then. I like their blend quite a bit. Um, Build the Soil, um, Subcool's uh, Soil Recipes, and a few others are ones that I really want to try. Um, generally, I just build my own, and they're very simple. It's just with what I have at my local gardening centers that just make it affordable. So when you make this super soil, talking about medicinal plants in general, there's a balance of nutrition that has to happen, right? So generally speaking, a lot of people know this, that in the vegetation stage, the plant typically uptakes more nitrogen. And then in the flowering stage, you've got there uptaking more of the phosphorus and potassium, right? So uh, when you're making this super soil, is there a specific balance that you're trying to achieve that will last you throughout your entire, throughout the entire grow? Or like, how does that work since the plant has different nutritional needs throughout the different stages of growth? That's a wonderful question, and that's something that like pretty much every super soil creator really has to struggle with. Um, you know, dialing in their recipes. I go for the one three two ratio just right off the gate for NPK, which is a uh, you know one ratio of nitrogen to three ratios of potassium and um, two ratios of phosphorus. Or I think I got that backwards. Sorry, um, but. Uh, I try to go for that mixture and I try to keep it simple. Now, if I'm going to play around and do like maybe two, four, eight, okay, well, I'm going to test it. I'm going to see how that runs with a tomato plant, just like how I'm going to see it, it runs with a medicinal plant. Um, and those are the types of things you have to look for. When I tell people to make their own recipes at home, when I'm looking for my ratio, just simple one, three, two um, is the, the simplistic um way to make sure that you're not going to burn your plants and you're going to have quality enough food. Now also what comes into play is EC and PPM when you're talking about that as well. So um, there's a little more variables into it, but one, three, two is about the ratio that I like to, to keep within. Okay. We'll get deeper into the fertilizer and the amendments that you're using in a little bit here. I know there's a lot of new folks that are just mixing up soil for the first time. And I think one of the easier ways for the purposes of the podcast of organization and trying to simplify the information that you're about to, to say is, is breaking it down into your base, whether it be like a peat or a cocoa or something else, uh, aeration after that and then kind of talking about like compost and worm castings and then the additional fertilizers and amendments that you put into it that's kind of really makes up an entire super soil so starting with the peat and cocoa are you using either one of those or is there something else that you're using as a base to begin so that's actually cocoa is the big one that i use i just get cocoa blocks um i like there's a few companies i get them from sometimes i'll just actually snag the cocoa that's made for reptiles because it's a little more cleaner sometimes so that's actually a little cheaper too uh but if they don't have that my reptile store in the blocks because they're they're out or something i'll go with like a rio cocoa or a um a uh, uh just a 
your in general uh, pro mix cocoa. Just go ahead and break it down or whatever. Um, but just a coconut husk or coconut fibers really does good aeration. Um, I, I do prefer, sometimes I do prefer peat moss in my mixes depending on what I'm going to go ahead and add to it. So if it's going to be a more earthworm heavy mix, I'm going to go ahead and add a little more peat moss to my mix. Um, I find that it, it holds a little more moisture for the long term versus uh, cocoa. Cocoa can really let it out. Um, earthworm castings really like to not dry out as far as uh, microbial life you know, going after them and things. It's a little more uh, better when it's humid and things like that. So promotes better bacteria. So that's kind of the basis I like to stick to. I don't really stray away from too many of those. I, I like to stick to my cocoa. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, not all cocoa is created equal. Uh, you can get them in several different ways, right? The brick, for example, is very common to where it's dried up in a brick and you have to actually hydrate it first. There's, uh, you know, some people do the rinsing and buffering um, or you can get the bag stuff. Let's get deeper into cocoa. How, what do you do to like prepare the cocoa to begin? Okay, so that's a that's a wonderful question because a lot of people skip this process, and even when they tell me it's like pre ready or you know it's been pH'd or whatever, I still do this. I do this with all my cocoa just to make sure. So, uh, first thing is is I go ahead and soak it in dechlorinated water that's been pH'd at uh, 5.5 to 5.7. I try to aim right at 5.7. That's kind of the sweet spot for cocoa when you're prepping it. And I like to add a kelp extract. So I use Germ Genie from um, the company I work with, but you can really use, you know, if you have a little bit of kelp meal or any sort of kelp extract, you can put it in there like a tea and basically just allow that to kind of soak up the nutrients from the kelp and use a bare minimum. I'm talking about maybe 100 ppm, 200 ppm max. You don't really want much. You just want to soak it and allow some nutrients to do that. Um, you're going to just leave that in there for 24 to 48 hours. And generally after 48 hours, I go ahead and wring it. As long as I'm getting to where it's squeezable out, to where it's just a few drops ringing out, that's the proper moisture. You don't want puddles and puddles of water. I'm talking just maybe, you know, just a little puddle in your palm, four or five drops out. You squeeze it. It's good. Um, you make sure you drain the excess water thoroughly and you basically allow, I usually do as a base, um, about five cups if I'm mixing, a, let's say, a five-gallon uh bucket. I'll do like five to six cups of cocoa at the base and then I'll start adding amendments and I'll usually do a cup of cocoa every so so often just to really make sure that it's layered through. Okay, so that's the cocoa and then for aeration, let's talk about that a little bit. Are you using any type of aeration at all such as perlite, pumice uh, or anything like that? Pumice is something I really like to get my hands on when um, the local garden center here has it. Sometimes they don't have it so I'll usually use perlite because it's a little cheaper. Gotcha. And then what's the amount you put in there with that five cups of cocoa? So if I'm doing five cups of cocoa, I usually try to do one to two cups of perlite and then I'll stack about a cup up. So roughly about three cups to three and a half cups total. So five cups of cocoa, three cups of perlite, nice aeration. Then I'll do about two and a half cups of earthworm castings to three cups of earthworm castings throughout, make a really heavy mixture. And then basically, since I don't have a composter where I live, I'm in an apartment, I don't want to compost to be all stinky. Um, I go ahead and add Roots Organic 707 blend, which is kind of like a nice even blend that I like to add. It has a little bit of everything in it, has some uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And then just for myself, I'll go ahead and hit it with a shot of Great White Myco. So that's kind of like the blends I like to make. They're a little stronger. Um, now what I'm making more for is uh, for strains that um, I don't plant my seedlings directly in this mix. So generally I, I use a happy frog, just a very, very bare minimum um, or a rock will cube or, or just a cocoa pod or something like that or a peat moss pod and I'll get them started. Um, whatever it is, tomato plants, lettuce plants um, or lettuce, you know, broccoli, cabbage, anything. It gets started elsewhere. Once it's been adjusted and it can really start up taking nutrients, I like to stick them into my mixes because they're a little more hotter or just a little more more nutrient heavy for the start. You mentioned you use worm castings. Do you use any type of compost at all? Usually people will either use the, the worm castings or the compost or some people will use both. So I don't have access to compost currently. I just use earthworm castings. So that's pretty much all I do is just a, a organic um, uh, earthworm castings I get from my local garden center. Um, 
we have a composter here in, in my garage, but it doesn't get hot enough for it to compost currently. If I was using compost, I would back down on probably how much earthworm castings I'm using. I'd probably increase uh, just a little bit more of the aeration. So instead of adding more perlite, I'd probably add some play sand to my mixture and just kind of give it a little bit of a, a sand through the mixture kind of. I, I've noticed that that's getting very popular and I, I like seeing that. Um, that it, That's also where I might think about swapping the perlite for pumice if I'm doing a more compost heavy mix. Um, so those are those are things you would want to think think about if you do have compost to access what you're using for the specific uh, aeration tools. You know, play sand is a very great granular uh, tool to aerate some um, more heavier or denser types of compost. So that's a yeah, great question. And then how about fertilizer to begin? I think you kind of touched upon this, but are, are you adding like a, a blend of a fertilizer or are you doing individual amendments? into the soil mix? So it really just depends on how, what kind of gardening I want to do. So if I want a headache-free, hassle-free gardening, and I want to do mostly just having to water, just pH my water, dechlorinate it, um, not worry about too much, I'm going to go ahead and make compost teas once bi-weekly, and I'm going to make them um, relatively, so if I'm in a seedling stage looking for the 200 ppm, I might make the compost tea 300 ppm. Why I do that is because there's going to be about 150 to 200 active ppms of, of activated uh, nutrients accessible after brewing the tea, but then there's still going to be some of the leftover nutrients that haven't been completely dig digested by the microbial life that we added to that tea. So you're still going to have like a, a leaching factor. So I'll feed my plants with a little bit of higher PPM. And then through the week while I water them, I kind of rid out that excess 100 PPM that they're digesting. And then all of a sudden you, you see that your plants might show some greenhouse burn, which is for those who don't know greenhouse burn, it's basically when people take a uh, plants at your local garden centers and feed them immensely so that they can ship them out to Walmart or various places and they're full of nutrients, but they're just burned on the tips, but they're not overly burned. So that's kind of like where I get my plants. And then from there, it's just smooth sailing for two or three weeks. And then just the compost tea, you know, two, three weeks, you know, every two or three weeks. And it's just smooth sailing. Um, if I'm adding amendments, it's going to be a regimen. So that's going to be where, um, I'm going to go based off my PPM. If I'm starting at seedling stage, I'm going to look for maybe just simple kelp extracts or simple types of uh, feeds that are 100 PPM to 200 PPM. I'll just feed it with every feeding or feed it with every, uh, every other watering, and uh, that'll be that. Um, all my early feeds get pH to 5.7 to 5.9. Um, that's generally the, the range I like to go with it. 5.9 is kind of my target range for the vegetative um you know, what they're uptaking, like you said, it's those uh, micronutrients. They really like the calci calcium, um, the magnesium, the boron, the manganese, all that fun stuff. So it just really depends on what your nutrient line is. And that's really vital. Um, and that's why if you're doing a super soil mix, it's really good to kind of mix it a little bit heavier that a not a seedling, but a juvenile, you know, a two week old plant, three week old plant can go ahead and prosper in because then you find yourself not having to buy nutrients, not having to buy a nutrient line. You can just go to your local garden center and grab some earthworm castings and throw, you know, a cup on top, mix it in and then just water if you need more um, food for your plants. So I try to be just simple compost teas and that's it. <laughs> So you're not adding in any like uh, bone meal, rock phosphate, any Epsom salts, anything like that at all. You're just doing the, the cocoa with the perlite, with the worm castings, with the 707, a little bit of 707 mm -hmm. um, soil you mentioned, and then just yeah. doing teas throughout the entire grow. Because they get, the teas get all the bone meal, the blood meal, and all of that. So I'll go ahead and enrich the soil because um, I, I like to make sure it's not too hot from, hot from the get-go because I found when I was adding my bone meals, my blood meals, my ratios were always changing because I was finding that, okay, this one type of plant likes this mix, but the next type doesn't early on. So what I did find better was just to make a very not um, neutral super soil, but kind of a neutral super soil mix that was happy with all my plants that I could, okay, if this strains of, of lettuce, like, um, you know, the purple head cabbage or, or this strain of, you know, lemongrass or compared to my, my, um, my peppermints or my spearmints, if they're eating heavy, okay, I can feed them more, you know, but if the, the back, 
the back basil's not eating heavy or the back um, tomatoes aren't even eating heavy, okay, I can back off. I don't have to feed them this compost tea. So that's kind of where I found my even mix is just adding the things to adding my excess nutrients or excess additives to the compost tea let them brew, let them really become accessible. And then you'll see, I mean, it's a night and day difference when you feed compost teas. Within two days, your plants will look completely different. So that's my favorite thing about um, organics. Let's get deeper into compost teas. So I know some people have a recipe for the vegetation stage and some people have a recipe for the flower stage. Do you do that as well? Or are you just one recipe or one tea type of tea throughout the whole grow? Oh, I definitely change it up. So it's uh, I'm I'm a believer of changing up your PPM range. I'm a, I'm a believer of changing up your pH ranges. Um, you know, shifting pH ranges are what's healthy for plants because that happens in nature. Uh, so for my vegetative compost tea, it's going to be around the you know if we're talking about a a nice vegging plant, five weeks old, four weeks old, something nice and hearty, it's going to be around the 500 to 650 ppm range, maybe 700 max. Um, and that's going to give them a nice boost. What, what that's going to be is, and what that's going to look like is usually uh, it's going to be one cup of bat guano, uh, one and a half cups of earthworm castings, and then I go ahead and add one cup of blood meal, and then half a cup of, or no, a quarter cup of bone meal. And that bone meal is in there just to introduce some of that PK. The earthworm castings, the bat guano, all of it has NPK throughout of it, really. Um, but it's just the bat guano and the uh, the uh, earthworm casting is going to be much higher in nitrogen and the calcium and magnesium and boron. So I'm just going to let that steep for 24 to 48 hours. I generally hit it with uh, some great white myco or if I... Um, my local garden center has a brand called Mike's, M-Y-K-E-S. It's a really great brand. If you guys have it in your garden centers, it is actually a very nice brand of mycorrhizae. Um, but you always let it blend for about 24 hours. Um, generally, that's ready to go. My flower feed's going to be uh, one cup of bat guano, uh, one cup of earthworm castings, two cups of bone meal, and then I'm going to do a quarter cup of blood meal. So it's basically going to be a PK-heavy uh, compost tea versus the, you know, nitrogen heavy, um, vegetative. Okay. And those ratios, is that for your standard five gallon bucket with about four gallons of water? Yes. Yeah. It's for a five gallon bucket. Um, roughly I fill that thing to about 4.5 gallons. I'm not gonna lie. I fill it to the brim. (laughs) And then are you diluting that tea down with water or are you just giving it directly to the plants? Yeah, so I'll actually take that tea and I have a one gallon uh, jug that, you know, we ha- we go through milk. So every so often I'll clean my milk jugs and I'll have a free jug. Um, but I'll use a one gallon jug. I'll fill it up about halfway. Then I'll take another free jug I have for my normal water, get dechlorinated water, pH it proper, go ahead and pour it in, kind of dilute it half and half. So it's 50% uh, of a mix. That way it goes longer. Uh, I make more, most of my compost tea and I'm able to off five gallons. I'm able to feed for you know almost a month and and, and I can keep that key that tea brewing um, we have a lid for ours that keeps it sealed um, you know I go and check the smell I check the uh, the healthy uh, bacteria on top and make sure nothing's growing in it and make sure it's all clean um, that's one thing if you want to keep tea prolonged times you don't want to keep it prolonged if you don't have good aeration and, and, and proper temperatures because you can grow bad bacteria really fast so that's that is key so um, generally the RTs go with how many plants um, we usually run and just vegetables and herbs and everything our teas are gone in like a week uh, but we'll feed you know I have 30 plus plants going plus maybe 20 vegetables so we'll feed all that in a week so every week will be a new tea for them basically Sometimes it'll be every second week because okay. if it is a heavier tea, it'll last a lot longer. Gotcha. Okay. On your initial mix that you mix up, are you aiming for a specific EC to begin or um, PPM? EC is a little tough for me. That's that's still things I'm getting used to uh, as far as like, you know, I've never... I've had organic farmers tell me about the electrical electrical conductivity with organic farming and saying like, yo, if you're not reading currents, if your plants aren't putting out electrical currents, you're not doing it right. Um, so that's that's been the goal of mine to get there. I'm more so getting there by measuring my PPM and making sure my PPMs are more accurate and on par. 
that was the big thing that I wasn't doing when I was first making my teas is I was just go ahead and dumping like two cups of this, three cups of that, four cups, of, you know, like just so much crap and just doing overdoing it. And then I check my PPNs and they'd be like, my runoff of my plant would be like 4,000 PPM. And I'd be wondering why they were out of range and all messed up. So that's where I started recently going, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make my teas a lot less. So when I check my PPM and my tea, okay, my PPM might be a thousand, but let me go check it diluted. Okay, now diluted, it's at 550. Perfect. I'm in range. Okay, pH, pH is 6.0. Perfect. Let's go ahead and feed. I check my runoff. My runoffs are now, you know, if it's I'm feeding 600 and I have a super soil mix like we talked about, generally the runoff would be about 750, 800. And that's generally where I want to be for a vegging plant. That's a really healthy amount of food for them because right as they get into flowering, you're going to want to switch them over and they're going to want that 1,000 range, 1,100 range, 1,200 range. I've had plants that love 1,500 range. So, you know, it just completely depends on what you have, what's fruiting on your plant, tomatoes, Sometimes can take a lot of nutrients, but yeah, I find measuring my PPMs have dialed me in much more than than what I used to do. And then you touched a little bit about pH. Your base soil is cocoa, uh, and I know a lot of people they'll aim for a different pH in cocoa than they would in soil. What do you typically aim for when it comes to pH in your super soil? So my pH in my super soil, I try to keep it at 6.0, 6.1. Uh, it's really good to run throughout the whole thing. Something you have to remember if you're going to use cocoa in any mix whatsoever, you're going to use plain cocoa, growing cocoa, whatever you're doing with cocoa. Cocoa holds PK and will leach it later on in the grow. So you always have to remember, okay, my cocoa is holding this PK. That means that my cocoa is holding on to a uh, pH range of around 6.3 to 6.7 because that's roughly where those nutrients lie and that's why our plants absorb them best at the 6.0 to 6.5 range is because that's that flowering fruiting stage for the acidic um, and alkaline nutrients that, that flow in that range. So I generally think like, okay, at 6.0, when, when flower hits, I'm going to start raging it to 6.1, but I'm going to back off. I'm going to start watering those first few weeks because I know my cocoa has leach PK. And generally the first two weeks of, of every time I switch to flower, or I notice fruiting happening on my plants. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and just feed a very, very minimal water. I usually won't compost feed. It'll just be like water and molasses or water and kelp. And I'll notice that my PPMs when I'm off the runoff will continue to rise, will keep rising. And then they'll just drop after about a week or so because that leaching has finally come out because they're, it's something with, um, I don't know the science, the true science behind cocoa, but I do know it's something with uh, those stages of cocoa, the fibrous breaks down of the plant, um, something to do with coconut husk and finally releasing the potassium and phosphorus after so many weeks or something like that. And it's based on how much you feed. Um, but generally the rule of thumb is your cocoa generally can hold it on for six to eight weeks after you fed. That's that's rule of thumb from most most cocoa growers that have taught me anything about cocoa. All right, so you have your initial super soil mix. You have a clear plan of the teas you're gonna be doing in the vegetation stage and the flower stage. Let's talk about container size. Uh, you know, I have people that are growing indoors. What container size would you recommend for those folks? And then I also have folks that are growing outdoors. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific container size that you, have, uh, that you recommend for those folks? Absolutely, so indoors, you can get away with pretty much plastic pots, fabric pots, I don't know, wood pots, PVC pots, whatever you want to get, uh, grow in and get makeshift with you. Um, and for indoor growers, you always have to take your grow tent or space or height into consideration. So it, you, one thing people always think, you know, oh, I have a two or a six foot tent. I have six foot of grow space. No, you really don't. So you have to take in your height of your pot. Then you have to take in the distance from the ceiling to your light and then the distance from the light to your canopy. So the light to your canopy has to always be at minimum 12 inches. Generally, you want it at about 14 so you don't burn your plants or bleach your plants and you get a really nice par displacement and you can maximize your light. Um, 12 inches is like when you're really dialed in and everything. So you always have to calculate that distance. So whatever that distance in, in between, so let's say you have five feet of growth space or, or four feet of growth space in between. Okay, so you know that at two feet, you need to flip your plants to flower or fruiting so that those plants double and potentially don't outgrow your space. Generally, I even like to do it a little shorter than two feet because some plants will go 300% stretch on you, so you have to be careful. Um, 
So with that height, you got to take into consideration what size grow tent or what size pot you have. For indoor grows, I don't suggest anything bigger than a seven gallon. You're going to get some monstrous plants. Um, I generally try to tell people one gallons, three gallons, and five gallons are like really the best size pots. Um, if you have a smaller size tent, your one gallons and three gallons can really do great. Your one gallons can be perfect for vegetating. And then you can transplant to your three gallons to um, for your, your flowering or fruiting stages. And they can be you work wonders. Um, you know, your five gallons, you're going to get into the much, much, much larger plants, which this is, you're talking about four by four growth spaces, five by five growth spaces, maybe a four by eight growth space, something that's larger, I mean, even a three by three. Um, you just really don't want to surpass your space. Like you're not going to throw a five gallon in a two by two by four. That's really too much. So just know your space. I wouldn't suggest anything past a five gallon if you really want ease indoors. Um, I always suggest more of a wider pot than a taller pot so that you have more grow room and more height to train your plants. And then for outdoors, it really makes a difference. Uh, you don't want black plants or, or black pots uh, for your plants outdoors because of the heat and you can burn your roots. So you generally want tan, white, or some sort of reflective barrier for your pots outdoors. Uh, you want a lot of aeration, but you want a lot of moisture uh, control. So what I, what a lot of growers do um, that I see is build grow boxes where they'll actually have individual pots inside these grow boxes. That'll be like uh, rings of sand. So it'll be like a pot of sand and then the, the, the plant inside of it and it's like a big grow box and the roots can go out from underneath and actually grow within the grow box. But there's a ring of sand around it that the growers can go, okay, it's a hot day. I'm going to go pour cold water onto the sand, make sure the roots are cold. Um, so you always have to think about uh, outdoors for temperature and for size outdoors. I mean, it really depends. You could go 50 gallon grow pots. You could get 150 gallon grow pot. You could do a a whole, you know, planted in the ground and then it's like a thousand gallon grow pot. So um, it really just depends on what your space is for your general average greenhouse grower. If you're not trying to grow 20 foot trees or 10 foot monsters, uh, you would probably want something around the 35 to 45 or 50 gallon marker. Uh, smart pots are really, really handy. Like I said, tan, tan makes a great color for reflecting sun while also keeping in heat for the nighttime temperatures. So that's, that's some things to consider when you're choosing your pots. And I believe you touched upon this in the beginning of the episode. You mentioned that you don't actually start out in this super soil mix, right? I think you said you like to use uh, Fox Farm Happy Frog, for example, to start your seedlings in there. So is that like just in a small solo cup and you're mm -hmm. planting it in Happy Frog, letting those plants grow to a certain point and then transplanting into your final container? Or are you going from like a solo cup to a one gallon and then up to like a five gallon, for example? So generally I'll go solo cup, one gallon, five gallon. Um, but if it's like an auto flower that I just want to go ahead and get them in their pot, get them uh, going. Or if it's like a, uh, a tomato plant where it's uh, it's something where you want to get it in a, in a smaller viney, more growing straight forward and get those little cherry tomatoes going. And maybe it's a, it's, it's a strawberry plant and you want your mini strawberries to grow more of a bush in a box or something. So it depends on what I'm kind of doing. If I want something that's more quicker, more off going, I want to get it instantly. I need the, uh, the medicinal qualities now or whatever. I'll keep them in small pots. So that'll be my one gallons and three gallons and I'll just keep them in there. I'll let them get root bound and then I'll go ahead and turn them over to the flowering cycle or whatever requires of them to go ahead and fruit. Um, that way their roots stay locked. Uh, it, the, the hormone, so for those listening wondering how plants even flower fruit or produce, produce fruit, fruiting bodies, it's ethylene. It's a, it's a female flowering hormone. And so whenever the plants are root locked in most species of plants, um, a self-preservation kind of signal goes off. So they're genetically a little easier to produce ethylene with. This is why hermaphrodation kind of happens in various species of plants. Um, and that's why plants will seed out themselves sometimes. It's really cool. So for most medicinal plants, if I want a very fast response, um, whether it's a photoperiod cycle or not, I'll go ahead and keep them in a one gallon, root lock them. And then if I really, maybe I want some 
a little bigger size to them, you know, those first two weeks of flower, I'll, I'll put them into, uh, a, a three gallon and then they'll get a little bigger. They'll get a little bulkier, but they'll stay relatively smaller. I can keep them in a little, uh, um, you know, two by two herb garden that I have going with a little Mars hydro or something, you know, something small, nothing crazy. So that's what I like to do. Now, if I want monsters, if I want some really nice trees, really nice quality plants, really nice herbs, whatever I'm doing, it's going to go from the one gallon to a three gallon, proper feeding, proper compost teas, training the whole what, nine yards. Then it's going to go straight to a five gallon. Uh, one week before I go ahead and flip under flower so the roots can actually uh, adjust, handle the shock and then properly stretch out root bound and, and really get a nice root system. And I usually dust those roots with uh, mycorrhizae. I go the full nine yards and really try to make sure that when they're going into those bigger homes, I'm doing them justice because just because you put a plant in a bigger pot doesn't mean it's going to get bigger successfully. There's still a lot of uh, microbiology, you know, root science that has to go into it, what they're eating and if they're taking in all the things. So I guess it just depends on what I'm growing, but generally I like to stick at that three gallon to five gallon marker. Three gallons are my my quick my quick medicine plants. Okay, and I probably should ask this earlier, but are you letting that soil cook for a period of time? Some people let it uh, sit for a while to let the microbes get to work, start breaking down some of those organic amendments, and then they'll plant into it, whether that be a week later, two weeks later, a month later. I've heard upwards of two months later people after they mix two months later them actually planting into that so super soil mix your mix that you mentioned in this uh, podcast episode are you letting it cook at all if so how long so i'm not two months i'm not that that you know patient crazy about it but yes i do let it sit so i'll usually feed um so if you can picture a little four by four tent for those listening and you have you know just a few rows of of grow pots filled with soil imagine the back row you know, four pots filled with plants, the rest of them completely empty. I'll water all of them with compost, give them all food, and I'll let those soils cook just under the light and the humidity and the temperatures, and I'll let them cook for about one to two weeks, and then I get to planting. That way I know the microbial life is active. There's some activated nutrients ready for the plants, and it's healthy and going. That makes sense. I want to dig into water source. Water can certainly be a variable, right? Uh, you can start with RO water, which has little to no PPM, uh, distilled water. You've got rain water, tap water. I mean, my tap water comes in at 485 PPM. So like, what are you using for a water source? And um, do you have a recommended, like a different soil mix recommended for somebody who's using hard water with a high PPM versus somebody who's using RO water? That's a very good question. Uh, that's one of the biggest questions I think I get all the time is about water because water can seriously mess up a grow. Uh, yeah, so I use tap water. Luckily, I'm in a place in Colorado where we have well water that comes out roughly less than 50 ppm. Uh, it's a little high in pH, so I have to dechlorinate it, you know, just make sure I pH, right, pH it right but it's nice. When I was in Florida, I never used tap water. It was very harsh unless I had a water softener and, or some sort of you know rain softener system or something like that. Um, I was never using tap water. So my best recommendations for those people who are using um, any sort of, or living in areas where it's harsh water and you don't wanna spend money on an RO system because RO is the best, reverse osmosis is the best. I think uh, if, if I could have an RO system to pump all my water, I totally would, but I get it. It's not always affordable for most people. So I would suggest uh, if you have to have to use tap water, uh, get aquatic dechlorinators to at least take the harsh chemicals and chlorine out of the water. Um, it's very cheap. It's, it's literally just a little couple drops in your water and it goes a long way. Um, and on top of it, you're going to want to use a mixture that is generally, I'm talking maybe 150 ppm's hot. So you're, you're looking at like, getting a very heavy base of happy frog mixed with like, if not three quarters of cocoa and just doing that as a mix with a little bit of earthworm castings because your minerals and all your, your stuff from your water is going to add salts and various things that your plants are actually going to feed or try to eat. 
So if you're not going to use distilled water, if you're not going to use anything to rid those salts or clean those salts or minerals or nutrients or whatever's inside your water, because sometimes it's limestone in people's water and it's super heavy limestone. You can have limestone build up in your soil and that's an extremely, um, you know, it can become limestone toxic for your plants depending on what you're growing. So that's something to consider. Um, so with water problems, if you have a severe enough problem and you want to cultivate your own garden, medicine, whatever you're trying to do to be self-sufficient, I always tell people it, it, it is an investment to try to get a rain softener system, a water softener system, an RO system. But really at the end of the day, the amount of headaches and jumps and, 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 and hoops you're going to have to go through to try to just get a, a successful harvest or plant or fruit or flower or whatever you're trying to get – with tap water, it's it's very hard. You're gonna have a very hard time. Your pH is usually all over the place. The problem with salts and minerals and water is the leaching effect. So cocoa leaches and holds nutrients. Well, when you put salts and things and you have salt build up, eventually that salt does break down and that salt will leach and cause toxicities. It'll, it'll shoot your plants out of range. It'll cause your PPMs to go from, you're sitting at 500, next thing you know, you're at 2000 because all these salts just leached into the soil and they became bioaccessible. And now your plants are eating them and, and now your plants are absorbing them and now your plants are all of a sudden dropping them all up back into the soil because it can't take anymore. And now your plants are just stuck in this cocoon drowning of nutrients because they, that's what's happening with the salts underneath the soil, essentially. I mean, there's much more into it. I'm not a scientist or a biologist, but um, yeah, I, I think we're spending the money in an RO system or bottle gallons of distilled water, man, it makes a difference. I wouldn't use tap water if it's too high. I just, that's just my best suggestion. Um, you really, water is everything for plants, collecting rainwater and filtering it with a YouTube how to filter, you know, little gravel salt things that can make a difference. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I wouldn't suggest tap water if it's if it's a hard water like Florida, Georgia, Alabama, or even Pennsylvania, New York. Those I wouldn't suggest it. I tried to use my tap water for a grow, and it did not turn out good at all. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, four hundred eighty-five ppm. That's very high. I think the EPA yes. approval is like no higher than five hundred. So it's like dancing the line on not yeah, being approved was... by the EPA. And, almost that flint's level right there. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it did not come up. My, my plants didn't like it. I invested in RO system and I haven't looked back. And I know there's a lot of people out there that say RO systems are a waste because you're wasting water. For every gallon of RO water, it's two or three times that amount is coming out of the drain line. Well, you can actually take that water from the drain line. You can not hook it up to your drain. You can actually put it into a bucket and use it for your outdoor plants, for example. That's what a lot mm -hmm. of people commonly do. They take that water and they use it for something else. So that's one thing just to keep in mind for anyone who is uh, considering using RO water, but maybe not gonna go towards it because of yeah. the fact they don't wanna waste the water. But for someone like me, I had to go to RO just because my yeah. water that's accessible to me is just not usable really for uh for the plants that i'm growing yeah, it just kills them it just doesn't do anything good for your plants so yeah i, I love your suggestions go to ro guys go to it <laughs> <laughs> so taking a step back and thinking about everything that has to do with mixing soils you know creating a super soil what advice do you have for someone who's new to mixing soils less is more yeah, don't overdo it. Just uh, less is so much more. If you're if you're really if you're going down to your local grow center, this is all you need. You know, I, I've talked to a bunch of different cultivators: Kyle Cushman, Eric Brandstad, um, the Dank Duchess, uh, smoking with Pod, all sorts of people. And Mister Grow, it's now getting to talk. You know, <laughs> get to talk to him. So it's definitely been really great. But I think every one of you guys will always agree that less is more. You know, just Go ahead and do bare minimum, grab, if you're not sure if you want peat moss or cocoa, okay. Go grab a nice blend of soil, go grab a little bit of peat moss, toss it in. Go grab a little bone meal, blood meal, toss a little in, and leave it that. 
Don't do anything crazy. I'm talking do like half recipe of everything I, I decided to tell you. Test the waters. Just do do less is more because when you go extrav extravagant and go buying everything and go spend your money on all this and then your plants fail, you're going to get disheartened and you're not going to want to grow and you're not going to want to cultivate because you're going to feel like you wasted a whole bunch of money. So less, 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 less is more. Definitely some good advice there. So wrapping things up, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Well, I am known as Derek, a.k.a. Chronic from Homegrown World. You can go check out at Homegrown World on Instagram. It has all the wonderful information of where to find us, what we do, what the company is, uh, what we're about, and what kind of seeds we have for purchase that are top-notch quality and all that fun stuff. Um, mainly, I do educational content, so you can check out my page there. You guys can always ask me questions. I'm an open book. Uh, I know a lot of YouTubers and various faces are kind of hard to get a hold of. And it's kind of scary. Like, should I drop my question? No, guys, drop your question. I'm, I'm happy to answer. And uh, it was a it was an absolute pleasure to come on this podcast, man. I'm, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. I'm trying to get as many thumbs up as possible. YouTube loves the thumbs up button. They recommend videos that get a lot of thumbs up. So hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode, and I'd love for you to tune in to future episodes. Derek, once again, thanks so much for coming on to this podcast today. I definitely have a new super soil to potentially try out in the future uh thanks for revealing your secrets there and i uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day yeah it was a pleasure man you as well take care peace out everyone